The Politics of Statues. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Mark Naquette, reporter for Bloomberg News. Jim Siegel, Statehouse reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Joe Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. And Mark Weaver, Republican strategist. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. I'm Ann Fisher, sitting in for Mike Thompson this week. Central Ohio is home to just a few memorials to the Confederacy, but the politics of statues has been an issue in Columbus this week. The most prominent local Confederate memorial is the Camp Chase Cemetery, where 2,300 Confederate soldiers are buried. This week, someone uh, toppled a statue of a Confederate soldier and stole its head from the cemetery. Protesters late last week called for the city to remove the statue of Christopher Columbus from outside of City Hall, as well as a similar statue at Columbus State Community College. They say that the statues honor a man who enslaved and brutalized Native inhabitants of the Caribbean. Joe Moss, a question has emerged again and again. Uh, where does the removal of such statues end? Is this a slippery, slippery slope that we can't return from? I really don't think it's a slippery slope. As a matter of fact, the whole topic came up because Mayor Ginther uh, published a, a Twitter. He's, uh, I guess the president is not the only one twittering. And uh, uh, referring to that particular monument, that particular statue at the Confederate Cemetery. Now, that statue is actually a generic statue of a Confederate soldier standing guard over the fallen comrades. I think that's totally different from the statues that are venerated in the South that in fact um, I think help a portion of the population still venerate the old institutions, the immoral institutions, and it's totally different. So I think that, that that's where the line is drawn. What about the Columbus, Christopher Columbus statues? That is a different topic altogether and I'm glad you brought that up. I was born in Latin America. The topic of of Columbus' role in the history and the narrative of the Americas is actually embraced there. In Mexico City, there is a um, uh, city block, a plaza, that is called the Plaza of the Three Cultures. And the three cultures are the European culture, the indigenous culture, and the combination of the two. So that is embraced in that particular um, in, in, in Latin America, and in Cuba we did the same thing, and I would offer that possibly as a, uh, as a way of looking at it. You know, but it seems like it's in the eye of the beholder, right, Mark Weaver? I mean, depending on where you're coming from, uh, true. it determines the value of these symbols. I think there's two different issues here. The one we've already addressed is whether these are good statues. This was a despicable cause when my great-great-grandfather fought in the Union Army, Eli Weaver, and so uh, those who want to enslave others, that's a despicable immoral cause. That's one issue. The second issue is who takes down statues? And it, it shouldn't be mobs. It shouldn't be mayors with tweets. It should be the legislative branch of government where the people's elected representatives can make a decision about whether we're going to honor this person, that person, or somebody else. If we're doing it through that democratic process, I don't have any grievance with people doing it. Where I have grievances, self-appointed statue pullers who decide because they're offended at one particular statute that it's their right to take down a government statute. And I think that's just an act of lawlessness. Now, in the case of Baltimore, when you talk about legislative bodies voting on this, in Baltimore, the mayor had run on the issue and went ahead and followed through on it after she was elected. Yeah, my view is the legislature is a better reflection of that, but at least it's an elected official. That's a little better. And you're saying legislature, you mean at the state level? Well, or at the you local know, here in Columbus, it would be the city council okay. as the legislative body. I just wanted to, to if, they, if a legislative body goes awry, we have an ability to yank them back with elections. But just simply one group of people deciding to tear down one statue will allow another group of people with a different views to go tear down another statue, and now we're doing lawlessness. It's interesting, though, you know, Martin, Nicat, this conversation that's being had across the country now. Yeah, and it, it, some of it was sparked, obviously, by the, the controversy over President Trump's uh, response to the uh, violence in um, Charlottesville, um, you know, and sort of the, the clash between the... Uh, sort of hate groups there and, and the protesters. And I think it's, it's, 
you also kind of pr provoked it too by saying, you know, as you, you said earlier, what's the, what is there a slippery slope here? So if we're going to take down the statue of General Lee uh, in, in Charlottesville, shouldn't we take down the statue of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson who were slave owners? And it's interesting because the historians have different views on this. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a school of thought that says, well, this is our history, good or bad, and it has an instructive value to have these statutes sort of reminding us of the history. Uh, and others would say, well, what's, what matters is sort of the totality of the historical figure you're honoring and also the reason for the honoring. Uh, in the case of General uh, Lee, Robert E. Lee, if you're honoring him as the you know, Confederate general who went against the Union, that's probably different than you know, honoring George Washington as the father of our country, I would say. And I think it also matters, too, whether this is you know, statues in a, in a public square, like a park, as opposed to, like in the case of Columbus, a cemetery. You know, there's some thought of you know, maybe uh, a, a public square is not the appropriate place for some of these statutes if there's controversy. Maybe a museum is a better place, which is actually where they're putting the uh, Ohio statue. Uh, as you might recall, the, uh, uh, there was a statewide vote to remove the statue of, of General uh, Governor Allen from Statuary Hall in right. the U.S. Capitol because he was a slave owner and a sort of a vociferous uh, proponent of slavery. Correct, yeah. a kind of controversial figure. So there was a statewide vote to replace him as uh, the, the honoree for Ohio. There's two statutes there, and Thomas Edison was was selected. And uh, Gen uh, Governor Allen's statue, I think, is going to Chillicothe at the historical society there. Yeah, I think I think if these statues end up more in, as Mark said, in museums. And, and those types of places rather than the public square uh, where instead of being uh, celebrated as historical, they're kind of celebrated and revered and honored. Um, there's, you know, there, it's, it's hard to make an argument that you should be honoring the cause of, of the South. And, uh, and so, you know, and, and this argument that it's, you know, you're, this is our heritage. Well, what, what heritage are you talking about here? Uh, putting, up, putting up statues of Confederate generals, you know, that's not a heritage. We're not talking about sweet tea and uh, good hospitality here. We're talking about, you know, the heritage of owning other human beings. And that, that is where, um, but, but I, I do, actually, I agree with Mark. I think it, doing this in some kind of orderly fashion where it's actually, you know, elected government officials who make these decisions is probably a much better way to go about it rather than some kind of mob mentality. Okay, uh, apparently summer break did not soften Republican lawmakers' annoyance with Governor Kasich. Nearly as soon as they returned to the State House, the GOP-controlled Senate overrode six of Kasich's budget vetoes. Among other things, the Senate moves to limit the power of the controlling board. That's the body that Kasich has used to expand Medicaid without legislative approval. The other vetoes all involved Medicaid coverage or payments to nursing homes. The Senate still could override as many as five more Kasich vetoes. Jim Siegel, such overrides are rare uh, in, uh, over the long haul. Besides the policy changes, what do they signal? What do they tell us? Well, they're signaling that the legislature has decided that over the years they've kind of lost, they believe, some control over Medicaid, which is the largest part of the state budget. And they, this, this started in, in earnest back in 2013 when the governor uh, was able to expand Medicaid without going through the full legislature. He got controlling board approval. Controlling board's a, a seven-member panel, six lawmakers uh, on that panel. And he got them to basically approve uh, Medicaid expansion without, without a full vote. And that, that ever since then, that has really bothered uh, some, some law, Republican lawmakers. So this is, you know, over the years there's been a lot of talk about we need to, you know, rein in some control. We need to have some more oversight. We can't just let the, the governor choose to do what he wants with Medicaid. And so a lot of this is aimed at that. There, those that they did approve, uh, you know, you have to come back to controlling board to get some approval to, for some state spending on Medicaid. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're setting some rates limits or, or you know, some floors on how, where you have to set some rates on neonatal care. Uh, they're saying, no, you can't add additional coverage without our approval. Um, they, basically, the legislature just wants to, wants to kind of assert its authority here. It's about Medicaid, but it affects how the controlling board operates in the final analysis. And some people are worried that it could have ramifications, unforeseen ramifications at this point. Mark Weaver? This is a reflection of some in the legislature's anger at the governor having used the controlling board to affect Medicaid expansion. And this is also a reflection of the fact that this governor had great influence with the legislature early in his term, and that influence continues to wane as his second term draws to an end. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting that at least on a couple of the overrides, it had to do with generating additional funds 
uh, with respect to uh, the $200 million a year in lost sales tax revenue for the transit authorities. And then in the other one, to raise $207 million uh, a, a year uh, that had otherwise been lost. And it, from my perspective, I, I thought the General Assembly in this case was acting in a more progressive, from a more progressive point of view than, than the governor, reminding us that we in fact do have a conservative governor. But it was historical what they've done. Okay. Yeah, I think you have to go back to James Rhodes to get the last uh, number of these these types yeah. of vetoes. And that was a Democratic seven, controlled. 1977. Was it a Democratic controlled gen General Assembly then, or? Uh, yes. And I a Republican so. governor. So. This is a Republicans yeah. and Republicans. What's interesting too, I think, is the the idea that uh, the Senate President was putting out that this might be an opportunity or or prodding towards compromise that. You know, sort of holding the idea of additional vetoes out with the idea, okay, hey, maybe we can go to the administration and work out uh, some kind of deal on issues like the funding for the transit folks or other these issues that are still sort of at play and, and not have to resort to, you know, just a pure override. Mm. Yeah, this is only, I think a Republican legislature has only overridden a Republican governor three times in history. Uh, I mean, three different occasions, maybe multiple votes, but, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this, as, as Joe was kind of mentioning earlier, there there are some vetoes that they may still do, um, and this one of them is this, uh, what they call the the Medicaid managed care tax, which we'll not, we won't bore people with all the details. But the bottom line is, there, as you said, counties and transit authorities are losing 207 million dollars in sales tax revenue because of a decision the federal government made, and the legislature is trying to find a way to to get them paid back. The Kasich administration has been very reluctant to do that. Um, and so they basically said, okay, we're going to give you a couple weeks to work this out. If you can't, we're going we're to pass this. And, and the case administration is worried that doing so will, you know, it, the, first they don't think it'll work because they're going to ask the federal government for a new waiver. And they also think it may jeopardize some money they're already collecting. So. Moving the pieces on the chess table. The eastern Ohio city of Steubenville this week saw a violent attack on one of the foundations of American society the sitting judge. Police say Jefferson County Judge Joseph Brzezzi, Brzezzi Jr. was shot as he entered the courthouse. The judge was armed and returned fire, but it was a probation officer who shot and killed the suspect Nathaniel Richmond. The judge was overseeing a wrongful death suit Richmond had filed against the county housing authority. Richmond also was the father of one of the Steubenville football players convicted in a high profile rape case in 2013. Judge Bruzis is expected to recover. Mark Weaver, if you read crime novels, you know the idea of a judge as a target like this isn't new, but it shocks nonetheless. How does this change or not the equation of security at Ohio's courthouses? Yeah, this is troubling. Uh, you may know that I've, I've been a prosecutor for the last several years. I've prosecuted in 10 different Ohio counties, so I've uh, faced criminal cases in courthouses around the state. It's a little known fact that most prosecutors and many judges carry guns. The uh, state law authorizes them to, including taking them into the courthouse. Most people Where don't Where it's know. otherwise banned. Yeah. Exactly. Concealed car carry permit holders cannot carry guns into a courthouse. A prosecutor and a, a judge can. Most people don't know that. We found that out, or the people who didn't know found that out when Judge Brzee's returned fire. What's troubling here is, and of course Judge Brzee's did not uh, preside over the Steubenville rape case that was a visiting judge. What's troubling here is that all of us who've worked in public service over the years become targets for people who are angry at the decisions we make in public service. And so a judge is a symbol for the rest of us. So whenever uh, a public official is targeted with violence for what they do, all of us should be upset about that. And what, what about, I mean, this is not a, a wealthy uh, county. It's not. The, the idea of the, what, what could they have possibly done to Nothing, because uh, if it wasn't going to be there, it would be at the grocery store. Uh, you know, it's hard not to see this in the same light as the congressional baseball practice, where huh. there were other public officials who somebody had a grievance with. Uh, you, you can't secure a baseball field. Uh, and at some level, you can't secure people from violence. This is why those of us who support Second Amendment rights say that people who are law-abiding ought to be able to carry guns and defend themselves. And in this case, uh, but for the fact that this probation officer was armed, a lot of people don't know that probation officers can carry guns, and that this judge was armed, it, this very well may have been an assassination. And you know, it's it's really, it's kind of an unusual thing, very much of an unusual thing. Right. I tried to check on how often something like this happens, and historically I could only find four instances of federal judges who had been the targets of assassination. Now, this year in April, a the equivalent of a common police judge, Cook County, 
Illinois was shot to death mm -hmm. under very similar remember circumstances. But aside from that, it's really not uh, that common. Mark, I don't know about prosecutors. Well, prosecutors too. You may remember that just up the river from Steubenville uh, in Youngstown, Ohio, my friend Mark knows about this, Paul Gaines was the newly elected uh, prosecutor there and while he was unloading groceries in his kitchen one night before he took office the mob with a very clumsy hitman came in and shot him and injured him but did not kill him and so that made a stir amongst the prosecution community that a prosecutor was being targeted in the Mahoney Valley and now further south in the Ohio Valley we saw a judge being targeted. Mm. Now, I forgot to check on defense attorneys, but well, I have a feeling that <laughs> sometimes we're targets as well. Well, they need you to, to represent them. So. With the chit-chat at the courthouse right now, people talking about it? No. <laughs> no, I think most, most people who work at courthouses know that uh, many yeah. judges and most prosecutors carry guns, and they know it's a dangerous line of business. What about the idea, one of the things is that the judge parked in the same place every day? Right. Maybe. Yeah, we wouldn't have that problem in Franklin slow, County. Yeah. The judges park underneath. There's an automatic door that opens up, so they've got a secured area. But in Steubenville, it was an outside parking place. And again, judges who are elected officials, their home addresses are public records, unlike many public employees. So it's not hard to find them if you want to find them, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Whenever President Trump stirs up controversy, John Kasich is waiting in the wings, ready to comment on national TV. Here's the governor on CNN this week with his take on Trump's decision to send additional troops to Afghanistan. My view would be, no, I think we need to begin to leave there. And I think we can reserve the opportunity to use intelligence to be able to strike any of these training camps, any of these places where our intelligence community begins to think that they're now building a base and a launching pad that would be harmful to us and to our allies. In the coming week, Kasich plans to unveil a bipartisan health care bill with Colorado Democratic Governor John Hickenlooper. Mark Niquette, it sounds like another stick in the eye to Donald Trump, uh, but there seems to be more going on here. What's the end game? Well, like you say, there, there's a concerted effort um, on the part of Governor Hickenlooper of, of Colorado and Governor Kasich to team up on health care. Um, they did an op-ed together in the Washington Post, uh, sort of talking about how what the Congress was proposing to do wasn't a good idea. We needed a bipartisan solution for health care, um, and we need to give states more flexibility. And, and they're going to come out with their own health care plan uh, to sort of offer as a, an alternative to what's being discussed. But it, it, the politics go further than that. Uh, Mike Allen's uh, Axios uh, report this morning had an item, um, not really sourced, but suggesting that uh, Governor Kasich and Governor Hickenlooper are at least thinking about uh, a joint ticket as an independent uh, candidacy for, for president in 2020. Uh, the idea, I think, would be Governor Kasich would be the top of the ticket and Governor Hickenlooper would run with him. And I think the idea was, you know, here's a, an example of a bipartisan kind of approach. Our politics are broken, you know, two candidates trying to, uh, you know, get together and, and solve problems the country has and approach our politics differently. And, uh, of course, it was sort of immediately denied. We're at the point where you, even if it's true, you can't admit it's true. Um, but, you know, they have worked well together. And, you know, there's already some talk about, you know, what are the political ramifications of this kind of team looking at, you know, possibly running in 2020 against Donald Trump? And what would that mean in terms of who would take what votes and how would this play into Donald Trump's reelection? Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting couple of months here. Uh, one, just on the, the health care debate and how much, you know, in this case, governors can influence what happens in Washington, but also sort of the political stuff that's uh, sort of swirling around it as well. Politics, yeah. Politics. I think uh, certainly Casey Hickenlooper is an interesting political duo, and it's also a tongue twister. Yep. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But, you know, I have a little bit of an alternative idea as to them running as independents. Mm -hmm. And that is for each run in their own respective parties with the promise that if one of them gets it, the other one would be the second in command. Yeah, but get through a primary the likes of which I we think, have these days. Good luck with that. But at the end of the day, I think that that mix would have a better chance at the general election than otherwise. And at least they would know early on if the if the country is ready for something. This feels like, like catnip for political reporters to me. I, don't <laughs> I think love it. I don't yeah. think we'll be talking kicking. And, and it's two years is, of course, an eternity, yes. uh, yeah, all things being equal. Yeah, consultants on both for both men are saying, no, this is not really going to happen. And but what does it mean when they're getting together like this and, and even with some um, uh, legis you know, proposed legislation on health care reform? Well, there is, I mean, 
you know, I think the, both of these governors have a serious interest in the health care issue and both want to sit down and have decided that the two of them have enough common ground where they can come together and have some serious discussions about it and try to come up with real proposals, unlike the, the kind of stuff we've seen flying around in, through Congress. They, they actually want to put thought into it and actually put it out there and let people debate it. Uh, and, and actually, you know, save health care and, and not just try to score political points. And so I think, you know, they have some common ground. I got a feeling, though, you know, it, it all sounds nice when they're talking about health care, but I, I can't imagine that the two of them don't diverge pretty quickly when you start getting into other issues. I mean, let's face it, John Kasich is no moderate. As much as he likes to be painted as one nationally, he is not. And so, and I, I don't know much about Governor Hickenlooper, but unless he's a, unless he's a really right-leaning uh, Democrat, right. and the, the, which he, yeah, then yeah. they're not going to agree on much outside of, you know, wanting their, their And is states there a, to have a, a large enough soft middle to support them? Right. And that's Ross big... Perot and Admiral Stockdale didn't get very far. Right. And governor yeah. Hickenlooper is an interesting guy. He, before he was governor, he was a geologist and a brew pub owner. So he has kind of an interesting <laughs> background uh, coming to the table. Have you ever met Bono, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, enough of the heavy stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about dogs, in particular dogs in restaurants. Well, not in restaurants, but on restaurant patios. State lawmakers are considering bills that would allow restaurants, brew pubs, uh, and coffee houses to allow dogs on their patios. Health officials worry about contamination and dog bites. Supporters say it should be up to the restaurants and their customers if they want dogs on patios. Joe Moss, the culture around restaurants must be changing if this is even an issue. We're becoming more European. That's actually what's happening. In fact, Senator Bill Coley of Westchester introduced a bill that would prohibit local municipalities and, you know, other, other sources of power from preventing you from bringing your dog to the outdoor patio. I think he hasn't gone enough. I'd like to see dogs inside and maybe even the kitchen. Well, listen, not every dog is as well behaved as my beautiful Gracie. <laughs> the red lab we have. <laughs> but I would say this, I'll take dogs on the patio before I have screaming children in the restaurant. So <laughs> oh, we're gonna geez. talk about the culture in a restaurant. Well-behaved dogs in the patio don't bother me much, but um, my view is, I'm a libertarian in this stuff, is we don't need laws to say whether or not dogs can be outside. Whether or not dogs can be inside, I think that's a fair area for regulation. But there's enough crazy stuff happening in the environment between the birds and the squirrels outside on the patio that we needn't worry about the dogs. But should local governments be able to decide this or should it be dealt with at the state level? Once again, it's that home rule issue. It is. I mean, Ohio's a home rule state, so we're supposed to be leaning Barely. towards home rule. hanging by its... I hear that. Yeah. Uh, so if you had to ask me to pick, I'd say local rule. I prefer government closer to the people. Yeah. yeah, I think that's more the issue here is should local governments be able to decide on, on this type of thing? Uh, now, you know, Senator Coley says all businesses can make these decisions and, and I know that I'm not the only one who cringes a little bit whenever someone makes a broad generality that because you're a business owner, every decision you make is correct. Uh, I think we've seen about a half a million court cases over the years that say otherwise in terms of uh, lawsuits. But, uh, but yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know how big of an issue this is. For, I know, I know some people who like to bring their dogs. I know, I also know even more people who would rather not be eating on a patio with with dogs there. But, uh, but I, I just don't. I don't know why you just can't leave it up to the cities who you know and just and, you know have a bill that tells the state to stay out of it. And, and I think that the bill still allows the business uh, owner or the to business itself yeah. to decide for themselves. So that's that's still a, a control. Huh. I was surprised this was even a law. I guess I didn't realize <laughs> that there was, I guess it's a health oh, issue. It's a health, it's a health code. You're not up on the dog patio laws, I guess Nicket? not. I guess not. <laughs> Shame on you. It's an issue. It's an issue. Okay, time for our final off-the-record parting shots, and we'll start with Mark Weaver. Political insiders are watching Richard Cordray, who's currently a federal consumer finance official in Washington. He'll be making a speech later uh, this month, early next month, uh, in Cincinnati, where he may indicate whether he will come back to Ohio. If he does and runs for governor, it will scatter the current Democrat gubernatorial candidates into other statewide races. Well, inside information. Joe Mott. Yes, unfortunately, I have something sad to report. Uh, in recent months, otherwise law-abiding immigrant mothers and fathers of American citizen children have been targeted for deportation by local immigration and customs enforcement authorities. The Department of Justice and Homeland Security have both maintained the false narrative 
that only the worst of the worst of these immigrants are being targeted, in other words, criminals, they are lying. That's not the case. What are they shooting for then? Is it the lowest hanging fruit? The lowest hanging fruit, to quote Ann Fisher. You had mentioned that before. Hmm. Jim Siegel. Uh, well, I'll just boldly predict there'll be no Kasich, Hick, and Looper ticket in go. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> a bold declaration right. from Jim Siegel. But will, you, will they come out with a, you know, plausible uh, legislation on health care reform? They'll come out with legislation. I, I, plausible? I can't predict plausible or not because that's, all, <laughs> that's always in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> okay. And Mark Nagat? Uh, Donald Trump has some of the lowest uh, approval ratings of any president at this point in the administration, uh, and, and some recent polls suggest he's lost even some more popularity give, with his response to the Charlottesville violence. Uh, but uh, just as a reality check, uh, he, I think his base is still with him. Uh, Bloomberg has a feature where we've been tracking uh, Trump supporters since the election in Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and all of these folks are still on board except for uh, they wish he would tweet less and not have so many self-inflicted wounds with Twitter. And by the way, he's still beating John Kasich in, in polling nationwide by a hefty That's true. Uh, margin. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, this is a headline from the Columbus Dispatch. Ohio mayors urge Kasich to do more about unfolding catastrophe of drug, drug crisis. He has worked a lot to uh, deal with this by way of Medicaid expansion, no doubt about it. He's done probably as much as he can but I also predict that that's just not going to be enough and that it's 11 a day now dying in the state of Ohio from uh, opioid overdose, mostly heroin uh, and bad heroin overdose. Uh, there's a lot more left to come. Whether or not you decide it's a state of an emergency, again, I suppose is in the eye of the beholder, but it won't change the fact that 11 a day now are dying it's in the state issue. of Ohio. The politicians have finally figured it out. It's a big issue. Big issue, and maybe they got to spend some time working on that one. Okay, that's Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We're on Facebook and Twitter. You can connect to all of that on our website. I'm Ann Fisher. Have a great week.